So welcome to this uh, third edition of the Evil Tree online seminar on adaptation to climate change. Very nice to see so many familiar and new faces here in, on Zoom. My name is Christian Relstab from the WSL in Switzerland. I'm then basically responsible for the technical procedure. So in my role, I will give a few technical instructions here at the beginning before we start. First of all, please mute yourself during the talk, but you can leave the camera on if you want. I think it gives a nice uh, uh, seminar atmosphere. And you can put your, uh, you can unmute yourself when you have a question later. It's very important to say that you are recorded uh, locally on my computer, as I just said, and also um, on YouTube, if it works. So if you are do not, if you do not agree to be recorded, then you have to leave the meeting. Um, after the talk, you will have the possibility to discuss with Moi and ask him questions. And you have three ways to do that. You can raise your hand in Zoom. You can enter your question in the chat in Zoom. Or you can, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, if it works, you can put your question into the YouTube chat and I will post it here. That's all for the moment. So we'll, I want to introduce our moderator of today. That's Felix Kugerli. He's also from WSL in Switzerland. He will introduce our speaker and moderate the discussion. Felix, it's your turn. Thanks, Christian, and good afternoon to everyone here. <clears throat> uh, before introducing today's speaker, I would like to briefly recall what Eveltree is and what it does. Uh, for most of you, that might be a bit boring, but for others that are new, this is just to let you know what this network is about. So Eveltree uh, was originally funded as a network of excellence that was supported by the European Commission during the initial period between 2006 and 2010. And after the EC support terminated, we established a European research group that was affiliated to the European Forestry Inst uh, Forest Institute. And it is now uh, a network of 30 European research institutions and universities that are all in some way involved in research on evolutionary biology in forest ecosystems, focusing primarily on trees and their associated organisms. And the prime activities involve science, knowledge, and knowledge, excuse me, science and knowledge exchange, uh, such as this online seminar that we are joining today. Uh, then there is also small projects that are running, uh, mobility grants that are given, or there's support for conference visits. Um, one of these major activities here is, um, as I said, uh, the knowledge, knowledge exchange. And this is really a tricky term. I should maybe consider calling it something else. Uh, and uh, the key of this activity these days is the seminar series. It's the second in a row now. And in the second uh, series, we are now into the third talk today. And this third talk is given by Moises Exposito Alonso. Uh, Moi uh, started out his studies in Sevilla and he moved via Edinburgh, the Max Planck Institute in Tübingen, Germany, and the University of California, Berkeley, uh, now to the Carnegie Institution for Science, where he's a staff associated, associate and he's also associated professor at Stanford University. The Moy Lab, as it's called, has a focus on how plants evolve to keep pace with climate change, combining ecology and genomics, and using modeling also to forecast how the populations will potentially evolve in the future and how that will affect, uh, likely negatively affect, biodiversity loss on the future climate change. So uh, the group around Moy is. Uh, looking at biodiversity at large scale, at small scale, uh, looking at model species such as Arabidopsis and Drosophila, but also plant biodiversity as a whole uh, across California uh, using satellite imagery data. So there's quite a broad scale, broad range of topics that uh, Moy and his group are covering. 
Today, uh, Moy will talk about locally adapted mutations and their relevance for climate change ecology. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing this talk today. So Moy, please, uh, the floor is yours. Right. Um, thanks so much, Felix, uh, for the very nice introduction. Um, I'm going to start on stopwatch to keep track of time uh, so I don't get too chatty. <laughs> um, yes, I was saying uh, thanks so much for, for the invitation to join uh, Able Tree. I've been following uh, previous seminars and they were very stimulating. So looking forward to, to learning more from this network. As Felix said, today I want to talk about how we think um, evolutionary genetic concepts can be key to understanding species responses to climate change and how we're using Arvidopsis thaliana uh, here in the rights as a toy really to, to play with conceptual frameworks. So when trying to conceptualize uh, what are the options to respond for species to climate changes, um, it is helpful to start thinking where species lives, that is its geographic distribution as we have in this cartoon, which we can reconstruct uh, from naturalist records going centuries back. So this uh, geographic distribution has latitude, longitude, and potentially a climate gradient represented by watercolors. Um, so after a climate shift in the future, there are multiple options uh, to respond. Uh, first, species could migrate and track their climate niche, uh, which would result in us observing a decrease in populations in the warmer edge and increase of populations in the uh, cold edge. And there are quantifiable rates of movements per decade um, already, although they seem to be uh, too slow. Um, and uh, another option, which is not optimal, is that populations kind of cope with the new environment, so they die out, called uh, local extinction. Um, so um, there's also painful evidence that there's uh, geographic distributions of many species shrinking or losing part of their populations, about 50% uh, of all species analyzed. So these two options uh, is what many researchers uh, originally considered when thinking or projecting biodiversity changes uh, in the 21st century. But of course, a third option, uh, which is the focus of this network, is whether populations might um, adapt to the new environment in situ. And uh, arguably, this will be the optimal response um, to maintain biodiversity across many species as the geographic distributions stay intact. But this is much more difficult to study as we need deeper understanding on the genetics of uh, species and ecologically relevant traits. Um, and this is, has been hard to be done at very large geographic scales, such as the whole distribution of species. So how can we better understand adaptation at these large scales? To build intuition uh, for this work, uh, I think it is useful to start moving from thinking of a species as a uniform uh, unit like this that um, has a distribution and that might shift into the future, but as an ensemble of genotypes, each of which might be um, in different climate regions of the species and be locally adapted. So when the climate shifts uh, to the future, um, we might expect several eco-evolutionary processes to start kicking in. We may find some genotypes that might have experienced extremer climates to, to be pre-adapted. Um, and the, they might have certain ecological strategies that we should learn about. So we need to find those uh, genotypes and understand them. Some populations that might be susceptible could be rescued if there was enough gene flow or migration from those pre-adapted genotypes. We also need to understand these geographic distances. And other populations just might not have uh, any chance, they are too susceptible and they might become extinct. And all of these processes will be contingent exactly to how strong climate is gonna change 
locally. So we need to also measure this local change in the heterogeneous landscape. So I, I'd argue that now genomic data is becoming comprehensive enough that we can dive into these questions um, uh, more deeply and move into a genetics aware understanding of species responses to climate change. And of course, our model system, as I said, is Arabidopsis thaliana. Um, some of you might know Arabidopsis or have seen it uh, growing in the lab, but what you might be less aware is that it is a fantastic model for eco-evolutionary research, and you can find it in pretty extreme environments too. And it has a number of advantages. Um, of course, this is not a very good selling point for a community of uh, tree ecologists, um, but, but we can use it as a, as a model system to test ideas. This is because we have uh, one generation per year, which allows a lifetime fitness quantification just by counting seeds. It has a, an amazing geographic distribution, uh, capturing broad climate gradients, for example, in the West, uh, Western Europe, which is the native range. You find it from North Africa to North Sudan. Um, I've seen it living in very extreme environments, like in the snow or sand. Of course, we have immense genomic resources with the 1001 uh, Genome Project, uh, which I was part of uh, a few years ago. So today I'm gonna tell you three stories. The first one is mostly published work where we try to understand whether there is genetic variation for these species to survive a climate extreme, essentially whether there is adaptive potential and how we can measure and think about it. And then I'm gonna present two ongoing projects that are mostly uh, preliminary or unpublished uh, work. The first, where we're trying to measure evolution in real time, year by year. And the second, where we take a deep dive into the potential phenotypes and strategies that the plants are taking to adapt. So to begin, to begin understanding Arabidopsis um, potential of adaptation to a new environment or a new climate, we conducted these outdoor field experiments into location in Europe um, with genetically distinct Arabidopsis ecotypes from the 1000 genomes. The idea is that uh, if all the ecotypes are grown in the same exact environment, if we observe differences in survival or fitness, these differences must have a uh, genetic component. And the two locations where these were uh, conducted were in the center of the current distribution, Germany, uh, where I was based at, in uh, Spain, which is close to the warm edge of the geographic distribution, it's warm and dry, my resemble future climates. And just um, a small uh, parenthesis, common gardens are actually uh, uh, an old concept um, and probably one of the most famous early common garden experiments uh, were conducted by three researchers in actually the institution that I'm at in 1930s, Klaus and Kek in Heise, in the, uh, this field site in the western side of uh, Stanford campus. And this was along uh, the uh, tree plantings and transplants in Sudan of tourism. So long history, and it's kind of a dream to be doing similar experiments 100 years after with complete genomes of every population that we use. Um, so these experiments were um, slightly different from those early common gardens in that they were uh, manipulated. So we had these foil tunnels that excluded rainfall, and then half of all the replicates of um, Arabidopsis ecotypes were watered at a Spanish rainfall rate, as realistically as possible, in a German uh, rainfall. And you already can see that they like the German rainfall much more. Um, then what we wanted to look at is generally fitness of all these ecotypes. So how many they survive, which we could do because we counted half a million seeds um, and we know the survivors and how much they were produced um, by estimating the number of seeds that an inflorescent carries from this image analysis. But in summary, we have 25,000 lifetime fitness measurements for uh, 
in replicates for all these 500 ecotypes uh, or genotypes in different manipulated environments. And today I'm going to be discussing mostly uh, the environments that are most natural, Spain and low rainfall, in Germany and high rainfall. And you already can see that in Spain there's a number of ecotypes that have very close to zero fitness, whereas in Germany many have moderate. So first, um, the immediate question is, what is the genetic basis of local adaptation or these fitness differences? To address this, we leverage the 1000 and genome project. Every plant that we planted had uh, almost complete sequence for the whole genome. Um, so this is normally what my screen uh, sometimes looks. Uh, in the columns, we have all the positions in the genome, 150 million base pairs. Um, and in the rows, we have each Arabidopsis thaliana ecotype that we planted. And we can highlight positions in the genome uh, that are variable across ecotypes. There's about 10 million, uh, so quite substantial. And this is what I will be call it, calling pre-existent mutation or standing polymorphisms or variants. And they're typically either single nucleotide polymorphisms or indels. So leveraging this in quantitative genetic uh, models called genome-wide associations, we can try to see whether there are certain alleles in the genome controlling or associated to fitness. And we, I know that this uh, is a expert network, um, but I'll go through uh, GWA primer very quickly because I will be using them uh, over the talk. So genome-wide associations are extensions of linear mixed models, like this one that we have here, where the response variable is your phenotype, which can be fitness, and your predicting variable is uh, the genotype at a position in the genome. In this example, for a diploid, could be like TTTG, GG. <clears throat> and we can have a series of correction factors, such as a genotype random effect to account for uh, genetic relatedness or population structure. <clears throat> and the effect that we're interested in is the slope, the association between having a certain allele and your phenotype which we'll call allele effects. For convenience, um, um, we, well, first we iterate through all the genome conducting these associations uh, and conducting all these slopes. And then we, for convenience, represent the results as minus log 10 p-value in what is called a Manhattan plot along the genome, which is useful because the numbers, uh, the units here is the numbers of zeros of your p-value of the slope. And this allows very quickly identifying locations in the genome uh, that are most prominent in uh, genetic variants associated to your trait. All right, so we can apply this framework to relative fitness in these uh, environments. And in this case, GWA becomes uh, kind of a um, specific case where the allele effect uh, could be called allele uh, total selection coefficient because by definition, selection is the relative fitness between one genotype and a reference. And what this would allow us is to understand whether we're expecting that an allele will increase in frequency or decrease in frequency in response to uh, this environment, because if you have slightly higher relative fitness than the average, you become more common and vice versa for lower than the average. So with this, uh, we discovered that in Spain and low rainfall, with these Manhattan plots, uh, there are over 60,000 conformally corrected steps associated. So relative fitness is highly polygenic, or natural selection is highly polygenic, and likely most of the signal is dragging uh, from the causal variants, so link uh, selection. In Germany, we also see that it has an architecture that is polygenic. There are signals in every chromosome, uh, but these were much weaker because the uh, fitness differences were smaller. Um, so with this, unsurprisingly, perhaps we've seen that selection in the dry and hot environment, Spain and low rainfall, the edge environment is stronger. So how, um, do these effects vary across climates? Where certain alleles selected in each climate or where there are global winners? 
So in these plots, I'm visualizing whether selection was opposite, antagonistic, what we call in jargon, across sites, and uh, whether it was favoring local or non-local alleles. So let me walk you through it. So in these plots, we have one allele, one um, dot. Uh, so 1.3 million dots, alleles in the genome. And they're plotted based on the annual precipitation in the x-axis and seasonality in the y-axis of the geographic origin of those alleles. And we know their origin by using the GPS location from where the 1,000 genomes were collected. And we can uh, cross uh, map that to a climate map and estimate the average environment where these alleles come from. Uh, the alleles are color coded based on whether they were positively selected in green in Spain or negatively selected in, um, in Spain in red. Um, we have in black the average precipitation of Spain and the same we have for Germany. And I apologize because um, there, there's a problem there, but the dot of Germany should be around here. Um, and what we see is that alleles that come from low precipitation environments were positively selected in Spain. And uh, the further away they are, so when they come from higher precipitation environments, they were negatively selected. And we would see the opposite in Germany if there wasn't a problem here. Uh, we found that in Germany, high precipitation alleles were also positively selected. So what we what we're seeing here is a signature of local adaptation. Um, alleles are found in climates where they've been likely selected or linked selected in the past. And by replicating these uh, experiments in those climates, we find that the local alleles are advantages. So an interesting question arising then is, can we uh, understand the geographic uh, origin of these potentially locally adaptive alleles. So to study this, I made use of a technique common in ecology to describe species distributions, uh, called species distribution models or environmental niche models, um, which uh, I apply to genetics. So what we need for this is a set of geographic locations of, for example, Arbidopsis in this case, um, and where we have collected it, and they're color-coded based on, for example, one of the alleles that we found associated to fitness under droughts. So we call it a strong allele, and those that carry the alternative, uh, the weak allele. We can combine that with uh, climate information, climate maps, for example, precipitation, and using a classification decision tree, we can find what is the threshold of precipitation, for example, within which we would find a strong allele. What this allows is that even if you have sparse sampling across a distribution, you can extrapolate um, or rather interpolate uh, in locations um, where you haven't sampled and estimate this allele geographic distribution. Because traits that we're likely interested in, like fitness, are highly polygenic, we might want to do this for multiple traits, sorry, multiple alleles. So that's what I did here uh, for 70 alleles that. I had associated uh, previously to increase survival in drought. And I overlaid all these projections. So in dark, we find projections of more alleles versus in light uh, projections of less drought alleles. And this high local density of drought alleles at the edge of the distribution is uh, telling us that those populations might have experienced a stronger um, uh, climates and they've locally adapted to those extremities. So finally, we not only want to understand whether there are potentially adaptive alleles or where they are find, found, uh, but we need to understand how exactly climate is going to change from the present into the future and how that might favor different combinations of alleles. Okay, so before we've seen that um, alleles that are local in a climate uh, are typically selected in that uh, climate, reflecting local adaptation. So we could create a model where we have the climate of a given site, like our experimental sites, allele climate information, and we can describe this in a 
multivariate uh, space of almost 100 variables uh, to try to predict our results from the relative fitness GWA, the total selection coefficients, whether some alleles in should increase or decrease in frequency in response to selection. We can also include some background information of alleles, such as annotation or further evidences that in the past they might have been under selection. And all these relationships can be fit uh, with a random forest, a machine learning tool. So these models successfully trained, um, but to assess or visualize um, accuracy, one way we can uh, uh, address it is with internal cross-validation. So we can hide uh, part of our data sets from the training and try to predict what should be the total selection coefficients given the uh, alleles climate. And by doing this, uh, and with uh, bootstrap resampling, we find that uh, we have an accuracy of between 30 to 50 percent um, invariance explained. This showed uh, that there was predictability in our own experiment, but I also wanted to see if in other uh, published data sets we had any predictability. So I gathered uh, four different Arabidopsis experiments outdoors where they did similar fitness measurements and tried to re-predict what will be uh, their results. And long, long story short, it seemed to also hold, although um, we can discuss details later. So now we have a model that essentially interpolates whether an allele is going to be positively or negatively selected if we repeat common garden experiments across a gradient in Europe. Um, so we could potentially extrapolate it in time as an exercise to see relative risks or relative changes in environment, how that translates into uh, allelic selection. So that's what I did. I extracted from about 500 locations where we've sampled Arabidopsis um, across Europe. I extracted climates in the present, uh, about 100 variables, and in the future from the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, and they're the same variables. And I feed them into these models of selections. The output will be what is the change in uh, our total selection coefficient from now to 2050 as a proxy of an abrupt climate change. And then I can go population by population and see how many alleles that decrease in selection or increase positively in selection uh, are present in uh, those locations. So in red, we have locations where uh, the genotypes have many alleles that this model is predicting to become more negatively uh, selected in the future. Perhaps uh, in contrast to, other, to uh, our expectations, the very warm edge of the distribution didn't seem to become more potentially maladapted uh, using this approach, but it was rather the center of the distribution and mid latitudes. And my interpretation is that Potentially, these mid-latitude ecotypes might be adapted to high precipitation environments, but precipitation is decreasing and temperatures increasing towards Central Europe, making it more Mediterranean-like, and that could cause a wave of maladaptation. Okay, so for this first half of the talk, uh, we've seen many evidences that there is pre-existing variation in the species we know how to find it, that the strength of selection is higher in the distribution edge, all those selective forces changes change across climates. The edges of the distribution might be more prepared because they've already experienced extremer conditions and they've become more locally adapted. And that might make them uh, better prepared and, uh, and less potentially maladapted if we do an exercise of extrapolation into the future. As you can imagine, if uh, we had this for keystone species, it will be tremendously useful if we think of conservation applications such as um, assisted gene flow or protection metrics uh, relative to uh, this genetic risk that we are estimating. All right, so in the next sections, um, I'm gonna discuss ongoing work and I'm gonna uh, begin with um, GreenNet, a network where we are 
tracking genetic change over time. So to study evolution happening in real time, we've done uh, what is by far the most ambitious experiment that we could, um, could think of essentially, um, which is a long-term outdoor experiment in 45 locations across the world uh, where we are tracking genetics. So with uh, joint coordinators, uh, Nick Seppens and Francois Vasseur, we made a uh, stick mix of 230 pulled uh, locally adaptive uh, ecotypes, different regions of the distribution along with sensors and send them to uh, participants who would set up in uh, field outdoor station facilities, 12 subpopulation replicates. And each year, would sample the survivors uh, throughout the flowering time season and pull flowers, which we're sequencing in our lab. And um, so I just want to pause for a second and, and give credit that um, essentially everything that I'm gonna talk in this section couldn't be possible if people uh, uh, wouldn't have been joining this network and uh, diligently conduct their experiments um, in the last three, four years. So uh, it's all thanks to team effort. So before taking you to a first look at the data, I just want to acknowledge that uh, technically uh, this experiment was also difficult because we need to sequence tens or hundreds of, um, uh, of thousands of plants to, to really track evolution in so many locations and replicates. So here, here are some colorful palettes, uh, sorry, plates, <laughs> um, to make visible the humongous work of a technician in our lab, Ru Peng, who has set up high throughput DNA extraction and library prep protocols during the pandemic for less uh, than $5 a sample, which is allowing us to process over 2,000 whole genome samples for the price of 200. We sequence then these libraries uh, at high coverage in Illumina sequencing. Uh, and not, not that I'm saying pulled sequencing, because we're extracting DNA of multiple flowers from the same population together. So when we get back a genomic read from Illumina and map it to the reference genome, we don't really know what flower this read is coming from. But it doesn't matter for, for us because what we're interested in is, is in uh, island frequencies of these populations and how they change over time by comparing the founders and the derived populations. By analyzing these uh, frequency changes, we will be able to study uh, drift based on random fluctuations of trajectories or natural selection, which might produce more deterministic trajectories and might uh, signify that there's rapid, rapid adaptation happening. I also want to note that this is a technical challenge because um, bioinformatic software has been done uh, mostly for deployed um, calls uh, and VCFs um, and pop gene statistics are uh, mostly worked out for those human genetic cases. And we also have um, more or less twice the amount of the data from the 1000 Arabidopsis genome project, which was already humongous. So a postdoc in the lab is building a new C++ libraries to being able to handle uh, with these large data sets of island frequencies. So stay tuned uh, or reach out if you want to uh, use or test that software. So applying these methods uh, in a final pilot before the main green nets with three replicated plots we show, uh, we got a proof of concept that there's actually a rapid turnover of polymorphisms even in short time using this method of flower pulling. So here is a, an FST plot zooming into a window in the genome of a locus that we know might be related to adaptation because it strongly controls flowering time. So what we see is that there's a high FST comparing the seed band that we planted to the survivors, indicating that perhaps the survivors precisely had a certain uh, um, flowering time to survive there. And we also saw that if we sequence 
flowers early in the season and late in the flowering season, we also find high FST peaks as, as expected. So this gave, gave us confidence to go ahead and sequence thousands of plants from GreenNet. So what have we learned so far from GreenNet? Where did these experimental populations survive? Um, so happy to say that they survived in actually many places. So here we have a map of all the GreenNet stations in colors and the original uh, founder ecotypes in this black process. In red, we have places that failed due to logistical reasons. And we have a number of anecdotes for that, such as snails invading our plots. Uh, in orange, we have uh, locations where the plants managed to germinate, but they did not survive. And in green, we have locations where populations have successfully established at least one year and produced uh, offspring. So um, in the right plot, we have the density of samples across these first uh, three years. In total, this is 60,000 flowers pulled in 2,000 samples uh, from these 390 evolving uh, population replicates in 32 locations where they successfully established. And you can see that expectedly Arabidopsis uh, flowers in spring, and there are multiple peaks through February to May, which correspond to populations in different latitudes. And you can also see uh, that in some locations, there is a second generation in, in fall. If we look at the climates where all these stations uh, were in a biplot of annual precipitation uh, of those stations by uh, annual temperature, we see that many populations survived even at high annual uh, temperatures and even dry environments like my favorite location uh, from uh, participant Meraf Seifan in Zevoker Desert in Israel, although you can see that they were having a hard time. Um, and in fact, perhaps to our surprise, in the center of the distribution at lower temperatures, some locations were challenged because of low uh, temperatures below minus 20 degrees Celsius. But if they were established, they were highly productive, like the place from Arthur Korte in Wurzburg, Germany. All right, so green nets uh, population survived. And this is really an amazing demographic and phenological experiment just by itself that will allow us to improve our understanding of population dynamics of these species across many climates. But probably the most interesting question for everybody here and for myself is whether different genotypes survived or, ha or had uh, different fitness, which would create more deterministic allele frequency trajectories in our genomic data. So here's the first uh, raw look at uh, green net uh, data cut from the sequencer. This is just the first 10% of the sample. So all these are preliminary analysis, um, but they are a representative subset. So I'll, I'll orient you in this uh, complex plot where we have in the x-axis, the starting frequency. Remember that we send seeds that were identical mixes to all the participants and already contain three to four million uh, standing genetic variants. And these were at all kinds of frequencies. We characterize that frequency by directly sequencing seeds out of high coverage. And then in the y-axis, we have the change in frequency to all sites in GreenNet. So not a single environment, but all over 30 locations where they survived. And they were also characterized by uh, pulling in silico the, the reads from all the locations, which again were um, uh, a sequence at very high coverage, 5000x. So, two first uh, or three first observations really. Um, first, the average frequency change was 5% uh, genome wide. So, this is quite fast and corroborates. Um, other literature that evolution might actually be happening quite fast in natural population, like the work from my colleague Dimitri Petrov lab uh, in flies. The second is that this um, frequency change is not fluctuating only around zero, which will be expected under a complete drift, but it is biased to one side. So the reference alleles 
seem to be becoming more common. And this seems to be, uh, if we zoom in to this uh, area, this seems to be more clear for lower frequency alleles. And also if we partition the signal in synonymous and non-synonymous, it's clearer for non-synonymous mutations, indicating that they might actually be experienced experiencing more direct selection versus synonymous that might capture this background signal of uh, linked effects through multiple rare alleles that are linked. To see if putatively adaptive alleles uh, are behind this bias change in frequency, here's a plot where we again have the change in frequency in the y-axis, but now in the x-axis, we have the FST from the 1000 uh, genome project uh, across different geographic locations or different genetic groups in the species distribution. So higher FSTs would indicate that uh, these alleles are in the uh, native distribution more spatially segregated and they're likely more local. And what we see is that those alleles that have over 0.5 FST uh, most of the time increase in frequency. So this will be a further evidence that uh, perhaps Greenex is using those uh, potentially locally adaptive alleles to readapt uh, to all these conditions that we grew them in. But of course, uh, what I think will ultimately provide the strongest evidence that there might be rapid adaptation happening is looking in the details of every population in over years which is what we're working on right now, looking at allele trajectories at each location. But here, a teaser plot. Um, so this is precipitation of the driest quarter in green net stations and seasonality. And uh, we have all these uh, first 10% of samples in this uh, map, in these climates. And they're color coded based on a uh, MTS decomposition of the genome-wide allele frequency. So if they have more similar colors, uh, those two populations have allele frequency trajectories that are more similar. If they have different colors, like dark green and light green, uh, they have allele frequency trajectories that are diverging. And this uh, accounting for side effect and years effects in a um, mixed model, correlates with the precipitation of all these green net sites. So it does look like different um, green net sites are evolving in different deterministic trajectories. And this is dictated by climate. So what have we learned? So we now have tools to produce um, and analyze many thousands of plants, and this could be applied to a variety of species. Uh, we've used this to study rapid evolution in a globally distributed experiment, which is providing us with key data to start modeling Arbidopsis demographics. And we've seen uh, first preliminary results that frequency trajectories might be uh, part, partly deterministic and non-neutral, perhaps behind local um, rapid readaptation. And I think this data is going to be um, really an opportunity to test a number of hypotheses from the ecological genomics and theoretical pumpkin uh, areas. And I'm actually looking for a postdoc to play with this data and have fun. So finally, I want to discuss um, what potential ecological strategies might be behind uh, locally adaptive alleles. Up until now, I've been associating alleles to survivor, surviving or to fitness or to allele frequency changes, um, but we don't really know what uh, strategies they're providing. So that's what we're gonna see now. So very quickly, perhaps one of the most classic traits studied in Arabidopsis is phenology, flowering time, and specifically two behaviors common in some animal plants. So Arbidopsis ecotypes of populations have been classified in either spring animals if they have a rapid cycle in spring or winter animals if they have a slow cycle uh, germinating in fall and flowering in spring. As we have studied more ecotypes, this picture actually seems more complex but also richer. 
And from last year, um, there was a, a paper from Amy Smith's lab that um, provided key data to try to update this bimodal view of strategies in phenology to at least four categories, which I tried to summarize in a commentary and in this map. So there seems to be two axes of variation, germination in response uh, to cold, so whether they're gonna germinate in fall or spring, and the requirements of uh, experiencing cold of winter in order to flower, which is called vernalization. And it's typically late flowering plants that have it. And these are controlled by a number of loci and it's highly heritable, 90% heritability. Uh, and these two loci are pretty well known, flooring, uh, front, flooring locus C, which I've shown earlier, that dictates uh, flowering time and is related to vernalization pathway and delay of germination, which would block uh, germination in spring. And this, this uh, natural variation in these genes creates an array of strategies across the distribution, which I can go very quickly through. So first, in the very north, we have the classic late flowering Scandinavian plants that germinate in fall over winter for many months under the snow and then flower. And this should not germinate in the spring. They have a block, so they germinate in fall. Then the Central European Arabidopsis, which seem to be more related to humans um, and um, have very rapid, rapid cycle, cycles. So they do not have any block, they germinate in spring and flower in spring, and they could also do it in fall or in our growth chambers as we uh, uh, domesticated for laboratory studies. Then we move into the Mediterranean, and I think things get more complex. Uh, they are winter cycle facultative, so they can germinate in fall and in spring, and populations typically have two cohorts. And depending on the year, because precipitation is more variable, and also the altitudes, different cohorts do better. And we published some experiments doing that. And finally, we have the extreme case that might be closer to uh, desert plants, annual plants that have bed hedging strategies. They have a very low germination. Um, they can germinate anytime though, uh, and they have shifted their rapid cycle to winter, which is the only time in the year that is mild and uh, rainy. So those are fantastic seasonal strategies and adaptations, and we were learning a lot about that. Uh, but what cringes a little bit is how two plants that have the same flowering time can survive in highly different environments. So another common trait that we've studied is direct resistance to a dry down experiment, where we just stop watering completely. And during this, we've saw, shown substantial variation um, in about two weeks difference uh, from the strongest to the weakest plants um, before flowering. So this would be expected to be related to water use efficiency to survive longer. And as I've shown earlier in the talk, these stronger plants seem to be in the edges. Mapping this with the GWAS, we also see that it's highly heritable and highly polygenic. And indeed, it's slightly much, much more complex traits. Each uh, group that does GWA on some drought-related trait typically comes up with different hits. So anecdotally, I find a number of hits that are related to uh, osmotic sensing and control. So these are cool examples, but they're only two out of a myriad of phenotypes that might be related to coping with drought or stress. Um, and in the ecological literature, they've been categorized in these three main syndromes, which are not Arabidopsis specific, but uh, plant, um, it, for plants in general, which is escape, like flowering time, germination, and this would translate in trees also, bud break or skipping one year of uh, flowering. Avoidance, which are those traits related to uh, broad water use efficiency or acquisition and tolerance is really damage control uh, when you're becoming desiccated. Um, so we thought that we needed to analyze all these uh, traits. Sorry, in total, we gathered 1,800 traits from uh, published studies in order to understand really all the dimensions of adaptation in Arabidopsis. 
So uh, with Megan roughly postdoc in the lab, we've been decomposing this variation in a principal component analysis, uh, where we see that the first two axes already a capture, 45% of the variation. In this PC, we have one dot, one Arbidopsis ecotype, uh, 2000. Perhaps expectedly, the first axis is driven by flowering time or scape um, but actually with a suite of other traits coming along. Importantly, late flowering plants um, have high water use efficiency, which is often captured by metrics of delta carbon-13. But early flowering time have um, a low water use efficiency because they grow fast and they're wasteful in their strategies. This is also related to the uh, conservative versus acquisitive leaf spectrum strategy. So a main spectrum or landscape of scape in Arbidopsis. Following PC2, uh, I think is related to separating main training from non-main training strategies, which I've talked about already. And so with this um, landscape of phenotypes, with an aim to study uh, the phenotype uh, fitness map comprehensively, um, and combining these phenotypes with the fitness that we've measured in uh, outdoor conditions. And we use for this the Landy and Arnold famous formulation, which is essentially a uh, regression relating a trait with fitness. So positive beta coefficient indicates uh, positive selection on that trait. And what we find is that actually scape is selected in Spain low precipitation, early flowering time, plants uh, survived and reproduced more. However, unfortunately, because early flowering time is related to low water use efficiency, uh, in this low precipitation environment, it seems like low water use efficiency is evolving, which is kind of counterintuitive. However, the whole framework of Landy and Arnold was really meant to be run for many traits um, otherwise, we might be missing the actual target of selection or components of selection. So we run this framework uh, for 22 PCs that account for 95% uh, of the variance. And interestingly, we found a PC that was even more selected per unit variance than early flowering or escape. And this PC was actually associated to water use efficiency although it just accounts for 1% of the variance. So how is this possible? So to see this, uh, I reproject the uh, PC in terms of the two axes that are selected in the X, again, escape and in the Y, now we have avoidance. So before it was just projecting outside your screen and now it's in your screen. <laughs> um, so what is happening is that what is use efficiency uh, there must be a fraction correlated and a fraction uncorrelated with flowering time. And what selection is seeing or is, or is selecting for is both traits. It tries to maximize both avoidance and scape. But unfortunately, because of this correlation, anti-correlation with scape, we uh, find a net zero evolution of water use efficiency in this experiment. So natural selection has a conflict due to this correlation, anti-correlation of strategies. So why would these two adaptive uh, trade strategies anti-correlate? And more importantly, can uh, those correlations be broken so adaptation can back maximize both strategies? So it boils down to genetics. Uh, so if two traits, flowering, scape, or what is you can see, avoiding, are controlled by different loci, they might not correlate because they are in the same haplotypes, but if they're separate enough, there could be enough recombination um, that both strategies would evolve. On the other hand, if both traits are coded in the same uh, locus, that is, that will be a pleiotropic variant or, or gene, there will be constraints because you cannot uh, maximize both. And you can imagine, for example, a transcription factor or a signaling pathway that is deciding investments in uh, response to, to droughts in different strategies. So our next steps is to systematically look at genome wide associations for many phenotypes for fitness and for green net allele frequency catalogs, which is something that Megan is leading. 
So for example, in this plot, we have not one GWAP, but each row is one genome-wide association for one trait. And the accumulation of top hits in that association is uh, represented in dark gray. So at a glance, we already can see several locations in the genome where there seems to be association to fitness, but also avoiding and flowering time and a bunch of other traits. So these could be creating these uh, genetic correlations and would constrain um, uh, adaptation. And we have some further evidences that separate uh, or that indicate that this is really pleiotropy, not uh, linkage. And we can talk about that later. So these results uh, point to a potential conflict between evolving escape or avoidance. So an important and uncomfortable question will be, what strategies will plants evolve in the short term? And I think we need to better understand these trade-offs uh, because this might limit adaptation in Arabidopsis or other uh, plant species. Okay, so in the last section, we've seen that we can study comprehensively the landscape of phenotypes in Arabidopsis and connect fitness uh, to this and allo frequency to this landscape. We've seen that there might be genetic correlations creating conflicts of natural selection, and we should understand this better and likely inc include them in our geographic projections of adaptive potential in the future. Okay, so just to wrap up last slide, thinking more broadly about the future, uh, with what I told you today, we are starting to move really beyond modeling uh, geographic distribution, uh, changing in response to climate and moving to a genotype or allele centric perspective. We can now model population, demography, in currents and uh, changing climates. We uh, have catalogs of natural polymorphisms associated to different climate selection pressures. And we're connecting those with an array of ecological strategies. And all this will help us better understand and anticipate responses to uh, climate change. There's lots to do. And with that, I want to uh, thank all the supporters uh, of our lab, colleagues through campus and different networks and collaborators and our wonderful lab. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Moi. This was a very nice overview on this impressive work that you're involved in and that you have been initiated also, huh? obviously. Thanks. Uh, I would like to hand over to the participants to pose their questions. And uh, as Christian said, you can put these in the chat or you can raise your hands on Zoom by clicking on the participants field and raise your hand. I see Tanya is ready for a question. Please, Tanya. Hi, and thanks for the really interesting talk. And I can't believe you have so, so much done this big experiment. So really impressive. Um, so I wanted to ask about this um, uh, experiment where you see that this uh, it's actually the reference allele increasing and the uh, and in this non sinus changes where kind of the is it so that the more common allele is increasing so um, can that be partly explained by um, deleterious variation being removed or is it all adaptive or is there a difference at the end between those Absolutely, thanks so much for uh, that nice question. Um, so it could be um, it could be the deleterious variation being uh, selected out if the non-synonymous mutation is actually uh, in the is the actually the alternative allele, and we're just you know the orientation of what is the uh, the younger deleterious allele is just wrong due to reference bias. So that could be a much more boring explanation, which I hope I uh, 
I don't find <laughs> uh, is that these experiments are conducted throughout the distribution, but um, the most prolific and uh, experiments are in the center of the distribution. Uh, so we've received lots and lots of samples from around Germany, the Netherlands. Um, and that is where the reference uh, ecotype comes from. So it could be that uh, we're seeing, the first signal that we're seeing is that the reference ecotype is doing pretty well under our experiments, mostly because the, the bulk of the samples come from the center of the distribution. Right, but one would think that that can be corrected away. Right, so it, that could be, well, that will be a signal that we find if we take all the samples in bulk, right, as I did for this first um, analysis. But when we do this location by location, we might find that the reference strain does well in Europe, but somewhere else there are other things that do better, right? And this is from the principal component uh, of allele frequencies that I showed in the last slide. We see that there is uh, allele frequency divergence in different directions in uh, dry and, and wet climates, right? So that might point at not only the reference is evolving in these populations, that will be uh, pretty boring. So I'm, I'm I was happy to see that they are actually diverging. But that's a great question. Thank you. There's a question in the chat from Kirsten Sandwall. Uh, Kirsten, do you want to ask yourself or should I just read out? If I don't hear you. Go ahead, she says. Okay. Any <laughs> idea how or if these adaptation strategies may also translate to trees? Yeah, I'm great question. Right here. <laughs> yeah, great question. Um, so I think so. They, the escape avoidance tolerance strategies were not defined for annual plants, um, but different strategies um, in trees could be categorized in this, right? Escaping in, in a tree could be, uh, you know, timing well when you're uh, creating the new leaves in spring, for example, right? So everything that is phenological could pro in trees could probably be categorized as scape versus uh, direct general resistance to any stress uh, by building up like better roots, for example, or closing stomata like better gas exchange control, all these kind of things would be categorized in, in avoidance. So I see lots of parallels and I think um, something that might be worrying and that perhaps uh, plant ecologists should be studying is if um, escaping strategies um, are the first ones selected because they report a very strong fitness advantage in the short term and they trade off with other resilience strategies we might be selecting against, or climate might be selecting against these resilience strategies in the short term, but that would be key for, for the long term. So this is something that I'm, I'm trying to, um, to, to see if, if might happen in Arbidopsis and, and other species. And I'd be interested to, to hear uh, what you think about that. Thank you. Then Katrin here raised her hand, please. Yeah, maybe as a follow up question on what Tanya asked. So I was wondering, um, you said that um, the same alleles that were already evidenced to be responsible for local adaptation are then used for the re-adaptation. But would you expect this to be different in an outcrossing species? Because of course, then novel combinations of alleles would appear. And given that we talk about many polygenic traits, it might be then different combinations that lead to the same solution. And in that case, we wouldn't maybe see this re-adaptation effect. Yeah, I'm not sure why in an outcrossing species, um, this might be different. If, if anything, I think the, um, the signals would be clearer because there will be less uh, linked effects on, on allele frequencies. Um, so there are several reasons to think that 
locally adaptive mutations might, might increase in frequency, um, both from, I think, evolutionary rescue literature, as well as like general, you know, um, local adaptation or ecological literature. So uh, you might think that um, there, there is currently in the distribution um, uh, dispersal limitation. So, so a, an allele that might be locally adapted for a climate could also be locally adapted for another similar climate somewhere else in the distribution, but uh, it hasn't become more common, right? Or more widespread just because there's uh, a dispersal limitation. By doing these experiments, we allow every adaptive allele to potentially increase in frequency uh, in, in our experiments because we actually mix it and put it everywhere. So it's like infinite gene flow. And I think that is one reason to expect these locally adaptive alleles to increase in frequency. Another, uh, if we think just um, single population level in evolutionary res rescue theory, uh, which thinks of quantitative traits as a stabilizing selection model, those alleles with the strongest effects are typically uh, at lower frequency because of that pressure of stabilizing selection. So once that stabilizing uh, that phenotypic quantitative phenotypic optimum moves, the uh, alleles that first respond to this are uh, relatively rare alleles, which are also more likely to be uh, uh, spatially, you know. Uh, localized and, and less common. So those are the, the two reasons that, that uh, I think could explain this pattern and should be, again, uh, identical uh, for outcrossing or selfing species. The problem of uh, per that perhaps you were hinting at, it might be another question I'll close, is if um, we don't really understand specific combinations and epistatic interactions, that's, that might, you know, uh, be more challenging to, uh, to really get in this experiment. Okay, then we have a question in the chat uh, from Ramakrishnan Vasudeva. Sorry for likely not pronouncing it correctly. Would you like to pose your question yourself directly? Uh, thanks, Felix. No, that was perfect, perfect pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you so much, Moy, for this excellent talk. Um, first, as someone working in evolutionary biology using insects as a model, I could be quickly out of my depth here. So I was just wondering, um, do you see any pollen uh, sensitivities to climate change? Uh, and if so, can you select for pollen resilience? Because uh, we know from literature in the animal uh, science that uh, male gametes are sensitive to climate change specifically across a lot of model systems. Thank you. Yeah, great question. I, I think um, that might be the case. Uh, there, there's a number of plants um, that um, abort embryos or pollen becomes, um, um, yeah, just dies, dies out at very high temperatures. So that might be one of the pressures that we see in many plants. I'm not sure specifically uh, whether that, that would be the case in Arabidopsis. I, I would have to uh, check that out. Excellent, okay, thank you. And uh, Devrim has another question in the chat, please. Hi, um, thanks for the great talk. Uh, it was really good. Uh, learned a lot and I learned about this tool population that I wanted to ask. Um, so is it um, randomly subsetting the uh, SNPs so that it can analyze or using, I don't know, millions of SNPs, is it possible? And uh, the second question is, uh, because you did genome-wide uh, analysis, uh, perhaps um, um, probably more reliable, but how do you think that this, this analysis tool also can be used for targeted uh, pool sec, for example, data? Thank you. Uh, thanks. thanks so much. Um, <clears throat> so we didn't create population. Uh, we are creating um, a new software, which we call uh, Green, uh, Green Delph. <laughs> um, the name is still not, <clears throat> not fixed. 
that is C++ implemented. So um, I don't think population could deal with the amount of data that we have. It's Perl based. Um, and so Lucas Czech, a postdoc and programmer in the lab, uh, who is uh, an excellent C++ uh, programmer, is building this tool so you can really analyze millions of SNPs in a matter of uh, seconds to minutes. Um, so yeah, so he's in increasing the, um, the speed. I think right now the estimates are between 50 fold and 100 fold, uh, the previous software. Um, and we're also updating this software with more modern tools that have appeared since a population was created 10 years ago. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, so it is possible to do it with millions of SNPs. The second question is whether whole genome sequencing um, would be different from target pool seek. And my intuition is that there's no reason to believe so. You could you could do reduced representation pool seek or target sequencing um, and, and, and run this if you have very, very, very large genomes. Uh, then Christian raised his hand. Thank you for a very nice talk. I'm very jealous about your green net project. <laughs> and we work with I'm glad, Christian. <laughs> this is just not possible. We cannot do something like that. But, but what we do, and actually Benjamin Dauphin just published a publication about that, is that we retrospectively look at the allele frequency changes. So we take different age cohorts and we look at the changes that happened then. And you had 5% on average. And we had really, when we measured it, we had probably half to one to maximum 2% of allele frequency change per generation. And then we actually also sim simulated the data with Fred Guillaume's help, and we could not get over 2%. So with really extreme selection pressure and extreme parameters. So I wonder how you get to this very high allele frequency changes per generation. Of course, our generation time could also be wrong. That could also, that's also one possibility. But is it more, is it mainly mortality driven or uh, is it the, the number of seeds that are produced so different among, among individuals? Yeah, great question. And I actually, I, I love that you're, you're doing uh, pool sick of different age cohorts. That's very smart. I, I was thinking that if I had to do this uh, with trees, I couldn't do green nets, but I would actually do what you're doing. And, and I think it's very cool to be thinking that at some point in the next uh, century, we're going to have like, like regular pool sick of certain populations over, over the years in age cohorts. And that's also going to be amazing to to do pop chain modeling with overlapping generations uh, and directly you know keep track how they're evolving so i, I really like that approach um the the large alert frequency changes are contingent to the selective pressures the starting uh, standing variation um and you know a number a number of things uh, so i think they might also be model specific people have found stronger alert frequency stronger than, than in GreenNet, alert frequency changes in flies, uh, right? That have uh, a much higher um, effective population size than Arvidopsis. Uh, so I think it could just be that. Do you, in your um, populations that you're tracking, are those individuals um, highly diverse or, or they're like a single population? This is an average of populations, yeah. I mean, these are highly diverse population. Okay. But it's not it's not a population with all the you know species wide diversity like we have in Greenland, right? So the thing that these ecotypes come from every corner in the world and all kinds of you know locally adapted genotypes are competing with each other. So I think that might be a reason that uh, you know that allele that is going to be strongly selected is there, uh, whereas if we were just limited to the diversity within a population in Arabidopsis, we might see. Uh, less less selection, and then the other thing that you said, uh, you might be right. There is likely lots of um, um, lots of mortality going on in in field common garden field experiments where we know each individual's fate. We've seen that 
uh, over 60% of all the available genotypes out of 500 die completely. So it's fitness zero. And that is expected to create very, very large allele frequency changes, right? It's just 30% uh, of the ecotypes uh, stay. So all those mutations or all those private mutations will just rise to 100% frequency, for example. So is all your all your changes are based on mortality or I probably I missed it. Do you create? Uh, no, what I'm saying is that it could be mortality. I'm oh, sorry. Do you, do you every, you have an annual plant and do every year, do you, do you also take the seeds, mix them again and plant them again? Or are you, uh, with, are you, are yeah, you good, losing genotypes and by mortality every year now? <clears throat> good point. Um, so I, w I was referring that mortality is likely high and that might be driven uh, some of the signal, um, but they're also very variable in reproductive outputs, right? Like in the order of th thousands of seeds different uh, between two genotypes, right? So that's that's also uh, pretty large. And, and regarding the experiment, we just planted the seed once and then they're just living with the seeds that we put there. So every new generation might come either from the remaining seeds in the seed bank or from the new seeds produced by, by the surviving generation which we sampled. And then what we sample the year after, so two generations after, might be some new seeds that have germinated from the ones that we put, but likely that is, or that is, I think, unlikely. And more likely is that the survivors from second and third generation are actually seeds from plants that grew directly in these field conditions. So it's actually true generations. Thank you very much. Are there any further questions? Christian, is there anything in the YouTube? No, don't mention, don't mention the word YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's recording, I see, or is this just... Stopped after 42 minutes. Okay. I will correct that. Further questions here? Well, I think... Everyone is ready for a beer, except for Moy, I guess. <laughs> I think. Second coffee. <laughs> Second coffee, I was just going to say, yes. So if there's no more questions, uh, I would again like to thank you very much, Moy, for your uh, very nice overview talk, everyone for the questions, and I hand back to Christian for the closing words. Good afternoon to everyone, or good morning. <laughs> yes, thank you, Felix. And thank you, Moy, again, for the very nice talk and the discussion. I just want to say two things at the end. Um, no, three things. First of all, uh, the YouTube stream stopped after 42 minutes. I will hopefully correct that so people can watch the whole stream. Otherwise, they have to live with the first 30, 42 minutes at least. And uh, second, I want to announce that we have one more seminar um, coming, and that's the one of Stephen Palumbi. I hope you can see that. So next uh, week, same time, uh, not same place, I will send around the Zoom link. We'll have Stephen Palumbi speaking about uh, adaptation to climate change in the ocean. I think this will be interesting for many of us because corals, what, what he studies have, have probably quite similar characteristics like trees, they are sessile, they have huge gene flow, uh, almost unlimited gene flow. So maybe really interesting for us to watch what he wants to tell us. There are some seats available still, so please register uh, for, this, uh, for this talk at the Evil Tree website, you will find the link. And finally, again, I want to announce that in September, we will have the first Evil Tree conference here in Switzerland online or hybrid and registration is now open. Also abstract submission is open. So it would be very cool to see everybody in September at this conference. That's all for now. So I hope to see you next week at the same time. And thank you everybody for coming. Have a nice evening. Thanks everybody, that was fun. <laughs>